Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum, and this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. Here's what we're going to cover on this week's show. Number one, it's going to be very trans-heavy, and as I've said before, there's a reason for that, and there's a reason that you see the, a segment about this almost every week and why we're going to spend a lot of time on it this week, and that is because trans ideology is the purest and most socially powerful example that I can see of the way that personality disordered behaviors, emotional instability, demanding validation and participation in delusion from other people, I don't see any purer example of the way the cluster B mindset has taken over our public discourse. So we're going to talk about examples of how trans ideology is about much more than just trans. It's about con disconnecting us, literally disconnecting us from reality, from our senses, from what we can read, and from our analysis of this. It's about breaking your will by convincing you that nothing is real except what a favored group of people says is real. We're going to look at how mainstream media has been forcing this issue as well and doubling down as more people start to wake up to the farce that is trans ideology. Things like Leah Thomas, whose name is actually William, becoming the number one collegiate female swimmer in the nation overnight after being 426th as a man. And we've got a, a hell of an article from Newsweek to show you from a gender studies professor um, you're almost going to think it's parody when I read it to you, uh, but I think she actually means it. And finally, we're going to talk about the concept of two concepts, actually, the concept of pronouns, what they do and what they mean, and the concept of what we call respect. And the questions we're going to ask are, what does respect mean specifically? You can't use the word respect to define the word. You have to use other words. What happens when respecting one person comes at the expense of disrespecting another person? Because that happens. And it happens a lot with people of goodwill. Not bad people, people of goodwill who are trying their very best to navigate the tension between their personal commitment to being truthful and to resisting the forces that are trying to compel us to lie. But the tension between that and their feelings of personal affection and, and proper conduct with people they like, care about, and respect who may be trans or who may ha want to have different pronouns used. There is a tension here. We don't like to talk about this tension. We don't like to put it right out on the table and say, this is a fight. There's a conflict here. But there is. And we're going to put that fight directly on the table so everybody can see it today. And I'm going to get into this in more detail when this segment comes up. But it's my position right now that when we use the pronouns, when we respect our favorite trans person or our best friend. I mean, you know, I'm using a lot of air quotes with my fingers here. I don't mean it as derisively as it might come off. I do mean to say, yeah, alleged respect, but I don't mean to say everybody who uses these words is just a brazen liar. That's not what I'm trying to get across. But it seems to me that when we concede to this, when we use the pronouns, when we argue in public about why we do this and we tie it to the concept of because I love my friend or respect my friend, we have taken what used to be a private act and made it a public act and a political act. This is going to make some people unhappy, I know. But I, I'm afraid that today in 2022, in the atmosphere that we're living in right now, even, even if you don't like it, even if you intend to make it private, you're not engaging in a private one-on-one -on -one act anymore. You're, doing, you're, you're engaging in public politics, and it affects us. So let's, let me give you some examples, because I, I want to feed you. <laughs> Listen to me. I want to feed you. <laughs> Actually, I had this delicious taco salad. Half of it is still sitting in the refrigerator. <laughs> you definitely want my taco salad. 
<laughs> I'm going to leave a trail of breadcrumbs for you and show you some examples before we get to that deeper conversation of what it looks like to respect the pronouns and where it has led us over the past several years. Here's a good one. <laughs> You know, I have to have this on here because if I didn't talk about it, you guys would be like, why aren't you talking about it? <laughs> We're going to talk about Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson and her confirmation hearing in front of the Senate. Most of the listeners are U.S., but not not everybody is. For those of you who are not, our Supreme Court, um, when a justice is going to be replaced, our appointments are lifetime tenure. So everybody who is put on the Supreme Court has a lifetime tenure. And this is the highest court in the land. This is the last stop. This is where they adjudicate conflicts between different parties that hinge on constitutional questions and constitutional rights. So Supreme Court decisions are acts of interpreting our founding documents. They're about first principles, and they have the effect, although this is the judicial and not the legislative branch, the Supreme Court is often called on to settle disputes between two sides who say, I'm doing the constitutional thing, and the other side says, no, you're not, I'm doing the constitutional thing. It has the effect in the end of making law. Even though that isn't its purpose, that's what happens. So here we are with a nomination to the Supreme Court, um, judge and lawyer Katanji Brown Jackson. I have not looked extensively into her record, but I see the conversation that's happening, and there are a lot of people who are concerned at what they believe is her record of being lenient when she sentences uh, those who are accused of or convicted of <clears throat> child pornography and other sexual offense uh, categories. I have also heard from some commentators that her sentencing record is not out of step with other judges who also tend to sentence the way she does, which has been described as below the federal guidelines for these crimes. If that's that, And that may well be the case, I don't know. But whether or not it's the case, it is a legitimate concern for people to have to say, I think these crimes ought to be sentenced longer. I think there needs to be a bigger deterrent effect. I am concerned that you appear to be excessively sympathetic to child abusers. I'm not saying that I know this is true of her, but it is a reasonable position to take if you believe this. It's not an insult, and it's not an assault on anybody. This is a person who's getting a lifetime tenure. This is a person who will be making some of the most important decisions and decisions that affect you and me and every person in this country for the rest of our lives. It seems to me, I can't imagine a candidate for a position that would deserve more scrutiny. This position deserves the most intense scrutiny possible. Yet, it is often a partisan game. We talk about, well, a liberal justice is going to be appointed or a conservative justice is going to be appointed. And these, these are um, they're euphemisms for Democrat and Republican. They don't actually mean them. They just don't want to come right out and baldly admit the truth, which is that we put Democratic judges on the bench and we put Republican judges on the bench. And yeah, it's about parties. But it is. But I see, so every time that happens, usually the side who wants the nominee to win will complain that they're not being treated fairly. You know, um, everybody's always going to complain that way. But I'm watching this right now with Katanji Brown Jackson and the way people on the left, political commentators, are talking about the questions that senators, Republican senators, are putting uh, to Miss uh, Jackson Brown. They're acting like what, what these senators are doing is an assault an assault against her. They're not using that word, but they are using that moral tone, that it's out of bounds, it's excessive, and the implication is very clear. This thing, you know I have a thing about implication. It bothers me a lot because 
Uh, not not the phenomenon of implication. Implication is one tool of communication that all humans use at some point or another. What bothers me is the way we use it these days because everyone's using it. They use implication rather than directly saying what they mean. And then they disingenuously pretend that if you pick up on their implication that you are mind reading them and straw manning them and putting words in my mouth. It's a liar's technique, right? I use implication too. And sometimes I probably try to get away with things in implication that I didn't really want to say because, you know, I can be a jerk sometimes too. But um, I don't do it very much because I just say exactly what I mean most of the time. That's why I'm constantly getting banned from Twitter <laughs> and Facebook. <laughs> so, I, you know, we heard this week, um, I saw a headline in the Washington Post about this hearing with Judge Katanji Jackson Brown. How low will Republicans go when they grill her? Go low. Well, Let's see how low they go. This is a very short clip. I think it's only about nine or 10 seconds. Let's take a listen. Uh, can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? N not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. The meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition? Is that it? Yeah, I guess that's it. Okay, so you heard that little exchange. And... <laughs> my friends. Well, and my enemies too, if you like. Um, this is where we are. Can you provide me a definition of woman? And I'm going to illustrate the stagecraft here. If you're only listening, you couldn't see the look. This was Senator Marsha Blackburn, by the way, who was asking uh, Judge Katanji Jackson Brown to answer this question. Judge Jackson Brown was making a quizzical look on her face like a, this is strange. Why would you be asking this? She was clearly meaning to affect a demeanor um, that said, this is inappropriate and everyone of, of everyone can see it. She was acting like she found this shocking. She didn't. She knew exactly what she was doing. No, I can't provide a definition in this context. What context? Which context changes the answer to that question? I'll keep waiting. The answer is there is no context in which the definition of woman is different on one day than another day. But the best part, of course, is I'm not a biologist. Really? Have you met yourself, Judge Jackson Brown? Have you ever been naked alone with yourself? Have you taken a shower with yourself? If you did, did you ever look down? Did you notice what's down there? And what isn't down there? We presume. It's 2022, so who knows? Uh, so there are apparently a whole bunch of questions that we stupid people, we non-degreed, non-credentialed professionals, can't get the answers to. I thought of a few of them. You can probably think of some more. If you can, please leave them in the comments on YouTube. Well, I think the structure surrounding me is a house, but I'm not an architect. I think the four-wheeled conveyance that brought me here today is a car, but I'm not a mechanic. I think that the three quadrupeds who live in the house with me are cats, but not a veterinarian. Um, and I'm not even sure about my own feelings because sometimes I think I'm feeling anxiety, but a psychiatrist hasn't confirmed that I'm feeling that, so I, I really can't tell you. You'd have to ask him. <laughs> Notice how this plays into the new value that we are all supposed to have internalized, and that value is only capital E experts know things. Other people don't know things if they're not 
experts. Only public health experts can tell you what health choices you should make. Only professional fact checkers can tell you whether a politician is actually lying. You can't know these things, and if you think you can, you're arrogant and you're getting above your station. But why should we be surprised about this? We live in a country that about 30 years ago decided that we needed a professional category called wedding planners in order to get married. Oh, you're not getting that? I know. You know why you're not getting it? Because it became normal. Do you know how ridiculous they seemed 30 years ago? When people were like, are you serious? You're going to spend hundreds then, maybe thousands now, on somebody to tell you how to get married? Like, we didn't have this internalized idea that every wedding had to be a destination affair or an experience. Right? But now it's normal. We can't think for ourselves. I got one more I want to um, sort of tease your taste buds with before we go to the break. We talked last week about William Thomas, who calls himself Leah, who uh, won the NCAA women's uh, swim meet. I don't know the exact title of whatever championship it was, and I don't care. This is a British woman for whom I have a great deal of respect. Her name is Kelly J. Keene. She has also gone under the pen name Posey Parker. Um... No, she's not the actress. This is not the actress you're thinking of. This is a completely different person. Um, she is a campaigner for children and women's interests against the trans incursion. Men coming into women's locker rooms. Men getting on women's sports teams. Men being part of um, girls. Well, in the UK, they call it girl guides. Men can be leaders there now as long as they uh, assert that they are women. And Kelly J. Keene is one of the only women I am aware of who is as forthright, direct, unruffleable, and uncompromising as she is. It's a very unusual trait in women in the public sphere. There is no bullshit with her. She went and watched this meet with Leah Thomas, and then I and I, I believe this is true, but I cannot confirm this 100%. I believe this video is after that meet um, in another space. She comes face-to-face -face with a man called Don Ennis, who now calls himself Dawn. Dawn is at least 50 or 51, in middle age, divorced his wife, slapped on a wig that looks exactly like his now deceased ex-wife's hair, and claims to be a mother. Take a listen. On the, on the basis of the comfort, hang on, on the basis of the comfort and dignity of girls and women, I'm asking you, telling you. I'm sorry, the audio is a little difficult. My it girls, makes them feel uncomfortable. My girls and the other women I am with are very comfortable with me in the right. bathroom. Well, the fortunately, room. I'm not your daughter, and my daughter is also not your daughter. Oh, that's right. And she so would she feel, stay uh, 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 she would feel very uncomfortable. No, I, interrupt right. me. No, no, you excuse interrupted me. me. Excuse me. You interrupted me. I'm not here me. for a debate. Beth, do you mind? Right. I would like to, I would ask you to please call up your daughter. I beg your pardon. Whoa, I'm asking you no, as a mother. I'm asking you as a mother. Do not use female spaces. And I'm it very makes, uncomfortable. It makes women and girls feel mother, very uncomfortable. As a mother, you are I not. Am, how dare you? As a mother, I am very. You're not. You, a you have never birthed your children. You are not a mother, Dawn. Right, I took I'm a job of mine, which is even more. Asking, I was oh. So Kelly J. was telling Don that he had absolutely no business being in women's locker rooms. And Don kept saying, well, as a mother, as a mother, the other women around me, as a mother. This guy is just Peter Griffin from Family Guy in one of the drag episodes. Look at him. Look at him. It's Peter Griffin, isn't it? Yes, it is. He's just a 51-year-old obese man with a permanent smirk and a bad wig that looks exactly like his now deceased ex-wife because I'm sure it's a huge coincidence and he totally didn't want to assume her identity. And did you see that exchange at the end? He thinks he's very clever. He turns to another woman because he, to, in order to disrespect Kelly J, he says, I'd like you to please call off your dog. 
And then when the women reacted with outrage as they should have, did you see the smirk on his face? Did you see the smirk? Yeah, that's duper's delight. It's the narcissist smug, I gotcha. Some people call it an auto gyna smirk. <laughs> okay, we're gonna take a break, but I would like to encourage you to subscribe to our audio only podcasts. There are three of them a week in addition to the show you're watching, but you can only get them through your podcast app. You will not find them here on YouTube or on Rumble or on Odyssey. And you definitely want to sign up for that because this week we've got a two-parter. Part one came out today. Part two is coming out on Monday. We talked to listener Casey, who is a psychiatric nurse in an emergency facility, and she talks to us about what Cluster B looks like in her workplace, what the borderlines get up to. Um, some of it's going to be familiar, um, and how the values of validating borderline style behavior have infected the actual medical doctors and caregivers within the mental health profession. So sign up for our audio podcast. Thank you, and we will see you on the other side of the break. You know how podcasters are always asking you to hit the subscribe button? Well, this is us asking you to take a minute right now and be sure you've hit subscribe on your favorite video platform. Click that notification bell too, so you never miss our newest content. And don't forget to subscribe on audio too. We have audio only content that you won't find on any video platform, so don't miss out. Do you like Disaffected? Do you like it enough to help pay for it? We'd love to have your support to grow and maintain this show. Donors get special access to our monthly Zoom hangouts. They're off camera and unscripted. We talk about what you want to talk about. There are two ways to join. Patreon users can go to patreon.com slash disaffected or visit subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Twitter didn't like our old account, so we made a new one. Follow at disaffected P. That's disaffected and the letter P for show announcements and links. If you want our sass and snark, come see us on Getter at Disaffected Pod. Welcome back. Would you take a minute and share our show on social media? Put a link up to our show, to our YouTube channel, to our Odyssey, to our Rumble, maybe to Spotify for the audio. That's how we grow best word of mouth. And I know the show's controversial. So if you don't want to do that publicly, although you should be a little braver, shouldn't you? <laughs> Share it with just one friend. Just do it privately. If you think it's useful, if you think they could use it, pass us along. We'd appreciate it. Thanks. So I think, you know, every week I, well, not every week, almost every day I think about this and I've mentioned it several times and I'm going to keep talking about it until the issue changes. What comes after woke? Is woke peaking? Are we reaching a turning point? A lot of people are asking these questions. It doesn't seem like we are to me. And this week has felt particularly heavy um, to me. Excuse me. Particularly dispiriting. Kind of demoralizing. And of course the constant anxiety that those of us who are out of step with the mainstream mores always feel these days. So COVID mania seems to be turning off and was replaced by Ukraine mania. And I don't feel any better about the world. I don't feel any better about my countrymen, my fellow citizens. I trust them. I've never trusted very much, but I trust almost nobody now. And I don't know that I ever will. Because I've seen, I've seen inside people. We have all seen inside each other. Some of us don't recognize what we've seen in each other over the past two years, but many of us do. And now I know. It's, I don't think people changed. I think I just did not understand people as well as I do now. And this is how people are. Collectively, the majority of people will either silently go along with the dominant narrative, even if it hurts other people, even if it deprives them of their rights, they will silently go along with it. And some of that, some of that percentage will actively applaud it and they will act as enforcers or flying monkeys if you prefer. 
That is the majority of people. And this is just one man's experience. I have a job and a house. I don't, you know, what happens to me isn't necessarily reflective of what's happening to everybody. But constantly now, like, for example, I don't see any slackening of the cultural demand to play the pronoun game. I see it ramping up, actually, because the sector that I work in, the nonprofit sector, is very much on the left end of the political spectrum. So a lot of this is not surprising. But in my view of that sector and the people that I interact with, every week there's another person who's adding pronouns to her signature bio, professional signature bio at her job or personal. Um, somebody else who is um, going on about the latest um, lack of access that disabled people have to this or trans people have to this. It's just constant and constant and constant. And there are, you know, when you work in, in any sector, you often work with other companies, other organizations. Sometimes you work on specific projects with each other. And there are, there are many that I... Um, that I've worked with and continue to work with. I've got a lot of good colleagues. I mean, I've, I've been able to do a lot of projects on consumer education and what's effective and what's not with the help and expertise of people who are also in this sector but have an entirely different set of, of skills and research behind them. So, you know, it's something I really enjoy. But because most organizations in this kind of work are on the left – these mores, and and they're not just left anymore, they're woke mores, have taken over. And, you know, I'm seeing some of these organizations put out trainings and campaigns for people who, who want to work on a, on a particular project, blatantly saying, you know, we're going to be basing this on nudge theory. You've heard me talk about nudging before. Well, research has shown that behavior can be changed. But they, they make it sound very nice. But I'm just going to put it in plain English. Nudging is psyops. It's psychological manipulation. And helping change behavior is simply flat-out manipulation. That's not my idea of what's good for society. My idea is making information and skill building available to people who voluntarily want it, want to benefit from it, and can take it, learn it, and make it useful in their lives. If they don't want to hear the educational offerings that I have or a consortium that I'm working with has, they don't have to. I don't want to make people make the choices that I think. And believe me, I've worked, I've worked with consumers and people um, in in tough consumer situations and tough finance situations by the thousands, mostly over the phone and internet, but thousands and thousands of people. And, you know, there is, I do have personal thoughts about, just like you do, right? You may never say them, and of course I never say them to the people that I'm serving. Um, that's That's not my place and it would be rude. But yeah, I judge, and I look at some of the situations that, that people come to me to get help for, and I can see exactly how they got themselves into that situation, and I can see that they are likely to continue to, to deepen that problem and situation because they are not willing to hear that they can change it, and they don't want to hear that because making a different decision would mean they have to pick something that is not their favorite. It's not their first choice. And people are damn spoiled these days. They don't think they should have to settle for what they consider to be second best. So, yeah, I have lots of judgments. And I, I you know, if they asked me what I thought they should do, I, I could probably tell them. But I'm not going to tell them because that's not what they're coming to me for. But I'm out of step. I'm more and more out of step with colleagues in this work now. Um, and I am starting to push back 
a little bit more. I mean, it's 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 easy. Uh, it's easier. It's not always. Okay, how do I want to say this? It is easier for me to sit here in front of a camera and a microphone and talk to the thousands of you who listen to this show because I get to talk uninterrupted, right? This is just basic psychology. There's nobody here to push back on me. I can say whatever I want, blah, 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 blah. It is harder to to engage in productive conflict, not a fight, productive conflict, one-on-one in the real world. So yes, many of the things that I say here in the context of doing a show that I want to inform people with, but, but that I also want to entertain them with, is easier than having these negotiations with live people that you're working with and have, have um, maybe many years of past relationships with. I feel the timidity as well, but I've been trying to push myself to speak out a little more because I know that nobody else is doing it because I see that no one else is doing it. I don't see any emails uh, from other members of consortiums that reflect my concerns. If they're, if they're being shared at all, it's only privately. And I shared some of those concerns with some colleagues this week, um, uh, you know, saying, you know, this is my approach. I like to offer information. I don't like to coerce people. I don't like to strong arm them. And I don't like this nudging stuff. I think it's paternalistic. And what makes it so difficult is many of the people I'm speaking to literally have no idea what I'm talking about. They, they, and I know this because when they answer me, they don't actually answer what I said. You know, um, so I had a conversation with some colleagues recently um, over email where I talked about the fact that, you know, I don't think that people should ever have been coerced into getting the vaccine. And it has nothing to do with, um, with the, the specifics of this vaccine. It's, it's a question of fundamental principles. And we've changed our fundamental principles in two years, and I don't like it. The response I got back from my colleagues indicates they, they literally did not comprehend what I was saying. One person said, well, I suppose it depends on whether you view the vaccine as a good thing or a bad thing. No, you didn't read a single word I said. No, it's not about that. Even if the vaccine is a good, 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 good thing, I still think it is immoral to legally coerce people into getting it. I I can't have this conversation because I get blank, uncomprehending responses. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Oh, I got a whole 10 minutes on my on my bullshit there. You're welcome. I'm sorry. <laughs> this one is from the Department of You Will Be Faceless and Featureless and You Will Like It. Have you noticed how facial features in commercial art, things you see on the internet, th- things you see advertising products and services are becoming less and less human, more and more abstract, less and less identifiable as people? Because I have noticed it. Human beings are increasingly visually depicted. I was going to say drawing, but it's not actually drawing. It's all just computer drawing. Uh, and I think a lot of it is is probably stock shape. Here, this is a human shape put it with a lady head, right? Um, digital ugly Mr. Potato Head. Sorry, MX Potato person. So humans are increasingly depicted in these abstract ways. Their bodies are all stretched out. The proportions are are, are really weird and unnatural. And the identifiability of human facial features is decreasing. And while this modern commercial art is not the same visually, it does remind me in tone of Soviet propaganda, poster propaganda. Um, But at least the Soviet propaganda tried to depict things that were actually readable as human. And in fact, in some of it, it was even in an idealized human form, an attractive woman, an attractive man, a powerful person. We don't even have that anymore. Take a look at this on your screen. This, I I saw this on social media and um, this is from a guy who said, a friend just took this picture while touring a public school in Portland, Oregon. Oh, and I believe it. So the picture is, it, it has the word microaggression at the top. 
And then it says, examples of microaggressions are questions like this. Are you a girl or a boy? That's not a real gender. Did you have the surgery? There's only two genders. These are microaggressions. Do you understand? They won't be micro very long. They'll be macro. They're probably on their halfway to being macro right now. But look at the person. Look at the person depicted here. No, zero facial features, absolutely blank face. But what do we have? What is important to show us visually is his or her magenta hair and earrings. So we have signifiers of a gender, but no humanity. This is creepy. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's, oh, that you're just noticing things nobody else notices. Yeah, and that means they're totally fake and I'm wrong. I know. <laughs> Girl chase. So, back, I'm back on Leah Thomas here. Oh, you're going to love this. This is Newsweek. This is an article. It's an opinion article in Newsweek. I'm not going to slam Newsweek because I'm actually surprised Newsweek for for a mainstream publication has been doing a really good job of having contrary anti-woke opinions published as well. They're one of the only mainstream outlets that I see consistently giving a voice to people who say sex is real. Um, the police are not actually factually killing thousands of black men the way people think they are. Newsweek will publish this stuff. Almost no one else will. So they're publishing somebody on the woke side. I'm not going to razz them for it, but I am going to razz the author. So here's the headline. Here's how it appeared on the screen. Um, Leah Thomas's NCAA championship performance gives women's sports a crucial opportunity. <laughs> Strap line. Anyone who cares about the advancement of sports, and women's sports in particular, should celebrate her win. And you know what the original headline was? I think they changed it, but you can still see it in the URL. I think I wrote it out here. Where is it? Oh, come on. Tell me I did, because it's so good. Ah, yes, here it is. We should be celebrating Leah Thomas like we did Jackie Robinson. For those of you who don't know, Jackie Robinson was the first black American baseball player accepted into Major League Baseball in 1947. That was a historic first. This article is all about manipulating your emotions so that every time you see a reference to a trans person, the same emotions are activated for you. Your empathy circuit is activated the same way it does for someone like Jackie Robinson, who was actually discriminated against as a black person and broke the color line. This whole article is an exercise in emotional manipulation. And it starts right out in the title, we should be celebrating her win. Who's her? It's not William Thomas who calls himself Leah. It's really not. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go into the locker room while he's changing? Because the girls in there have all said he walks around with his dick hanging out. I think you know what a dick is, even if you don't, even if you deny it. And I think you know it's not female either. This is by Cheryl Cookie, Purdue University professor of American Studies and Women's gender and sexuality studies. So as the famous line in Futurama went, you have a degree in baloney. Studies degrees are baloney. They're grievance studies. That's all it is. Let's dive into the article. Quote, for anyone who cares about the advancement of sports, and women's sports in particular, her win should be celebrated. She should be embraced in the history of progress that sports represents and recognized as the trailblazer that she is. Oh, Cheryl! Oh, Cheryl! You're so empathy! Here's another. Quote, Women's sports are situated at a paradoxical intersection, wherein sex segregation is upheld through claims of biological difference, yet equality is preferenced, uh, prefaced on being treated the same and given the same opportunities as men. 
now I need to take you through her false premises. I know some of you have already seen them, but some have not. First one, claims of biological difference. Notice what she's doing there. She's stating it as a fact that it's just an extraordinary claim that men and women are biologically different. They're merely claims that have not been adjudicated and have not been tested. It's just someone said it on a whim. Huh? She's treating it as if it as if saying that men on average are stronger and faster than women is itself an extraordinary claim, not the ordinary one, an extraordinary one that requires extraordinary evidence. She has reversed the burden of proof. She's not right. She's wrong. And she's doing a reversal. It's ju it's just a narcissistic reversal. It's all it is in the service of confusing you. She, and the next one, yet equality is prefaced on being treated the same. Smuggled assumptions, smuggled prior assumptions that she never justifies. I'm going to pull it out explicitly. No, that is not how equality is prefaced, and a professor should be able to know better. In this context, equality means to treat similarly situated people in the same manner. Men and women are not similarly situated in a sports context with the exception of a few sports that don't depend directly on on height um, muscle strength etc she knows this she's pretending she doesn't know it next quote if we are to change this we need to ask some important questions how does one advocate for equitable treatment while also adhering to the notion of biological difference if separate is not equal in the case of schools you see this right Keep that in mind, separate but equal. If, if separate is not equal in the case of schools, restaurants, or other social institutions, can separate ever truly be equal in the case of sports? Would gender-based discrimination in sports be eradicated if sports were gender integrated? That is a whole pile of bullshit. And actually, this segment is going to be a little bit longer than I thought because my digression was a little bit longer. So bear with me. The technique she's using is, is called elision. She's deliberately pushing together unlike concepts to make them seem as if they share a common characteristic. She, as we said, she starts it right out at the front, comparing this narcissistic dude, William Thomas, to Jackie Robinson. Then she says, separate is not equal. She is using this phrasing specifically to provoke in American readers the emotions that most of us have when those phrases are used. In the civil rights era, that phrase, separate but equal, became a sick joke to people who could see through it. It was a joke to just, I mean, it was about justifying making black people drink from different water fountains than white people. She wants that emotion to come up in your mind, and she wants you to apply that emotion to Leah William Thomas. She's eliding things that are not the same. She says, would gender discrimination in sports be eradicated? Another smuggled assumption that she just wants you to swallow, and it's another elision. Again, she's invoking, she's trying to invoke in you negative emotions by using the phrase gender discrimination. Notice how she's erased sex from this. This is very deliberate, because if you remember sex, then you might think of biology, and then you might remember what you know about men and women. She doesn't want you to know that. She substituted the word gender because, as she said above, sex isn't real. It's only claims of sexual difference. It's only a notion of biological difference. Th this, this has ruined words like discrimination and judge because these words have been used repeatedly only to refer to unfair or immoral things now, all of us tacitly agree that any discrimination or any judgment is itself bad and oppressive. By accepting that, we have accepted that it is a moral trespass to exercise judgment, to discriminate, meaning to choose which one is better than the other, at all, under any circumstances. Discrimination is bad. Judging is bad. I, I know, I know. I, maybe, maybe the objection you want to say is, we're not all babies. We can think in nuance. I, I wish that were true. And I know many of you can. But the vast 
majority of the public is falling for this stuff. This is what they think the words discrimination and judge mean. You can see it for yourself. And now we get to flagrant lying. Quote, those who oppose the inclusion of trans women in women's sports argue that trans women have an unfair competitive advantage and that as a result, they will take away opportunities from cisgender athletes. According to the NCAA, these assumptions are not well founded. Moreover, there is a lack of scientific evidence that conclusively demonstrates a direct link between testosterone and athletic performance, end quote. Okay, she's doing a straw man here. She's lying, and she's doing a straw man. First, she's acting like, since we're not biologists, we can't tell men from women. She's gone to the Katanji Jackson Brown School of um, Biology Jurisprudence. We can't see or know that they're taller. We can't see that they're faster when they run. We just don't know. We're not experts. And she's also, here's the straw man she's setting up. She's pretending that the NCAA, a college sports league, is the arbiter of reality. It isn't. And they're not the research organizations and they're not the sports scientists. They're simply a sports organization that made a political decision. And she uses conscious and knowing misdirection to build her straw man. Quote, there is a lack of scientific evidence that conclusively demonstrates a direct link between testosterone and athletic performance. This is a classic straw man. Those of us who are objecting to things like Leah Thomas taking over in the women's category, we are not and have never been claiming that it's testosterone that does that. She wants that to be the case so that she can get to where she's going. We never said, nobody sensible ever said it's only testosterone that makes it unfair. She's pretending that that's the point in question because that's an easy one for her to demolish. It, it doesn't change the fact that estrogen does not, I don't care how low you get a male's testosterone, it will not make his rib cage smaller, it will not make his lungs smaller, it will not dissolve the bones in his pelvis uh, and reconfigure them into childbearing hips. It won't get rid of the fast twitch much muscle fiber, all of which is a legacy of male puberty. That doesn't go away just because you put him on estrogen. She doesn't want to talk about that, but she knows it. She's a liar. She's just a liar. I'll leave you with last one last ugly example. Quote, the Supreme Court unanimously decided in Brown versus Board of Education that separate is not equal and segregation violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Despite this, sports have been able to operate under a separate but equal framework upheld in part by the notion of biological difference between the sexes. Listen up, Cookie. You're just a goddamn liar. And Purdue, you should be ashamed of yourself. Come back and see us on the other side. You know how podcasters are always asking you to hit the subscribe button? Well, this is us asking you to take a minute right now and be sure you've hit subscribe on your favorite video platform. Click that notification bell too so you never miss our newest content. And don't forget to subscribe on audio too. We have audio only content that you won't find on any video platform, so don't miss out. Twitter didn't like our old account, so we made a new one. Follow at Disaffected P, that's disaffected and the letter P, for show announcements and links. If you want our sass and snark, come see us on Getter at Disaffected Pod. Welcome back. We'd love to have your support. There are two ways to support the show if you like the show, and I hope you do. Patreon.com slash disaffected or Subscribestar.com dot com slash disaffected and yes you will get a personal thank you note for me if you donate appreciate it so i want to close the show out today by talking about the concept of respect and how 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 it fits in with the with with lying and dishonesty and where the line is between white lies and consequential lies we've talked on the show many times about how we're all supposed to take a quasi-therapeutic stance toward other people, that our main duty is to validate other people. And what do we mean by that? We, we mean that we're supposed to give positive feedback to people 
who display whatever emotion is they they want attention for, whatever identity they claim that they have, we're supposed to validate that. And it's really hard to get people to give you an answer if you ask them to be very specific about what they mean by validate. Most people can't do it. It seems to just mean give general signal approval and and if possible, signal approval publicly is an important part of validate. But this this comes before any of our own interests. This duty, as as it were, overrides any duty that we might have to truth or accuracy in the era that we're living in. And it doesn't care if validating someone isn't actually good for that someone. It doesn't care if validating one friend comes at the actual expense of another friend or another group of people, a classroom of people, an entire country, an entire sex. This is a cluster B value. No, I'm not saying that everybody who engages in this is, is a cluster B, because thank God, the vast majority of people are not personality disordered, but there's enough of them in that minority, and you know I think that it's about 10% of the population. We have become recruited to be flying monkeys, enablers, validators. Many of us are absolutely unaware of what we're doing. Just like many people who are actually in abusive relationships in their home have no idea for a long time that this is not normal. But it isn't. It's cluster B value. And that value is my feelings come first or whoever the currently socially, and I mean this in a literal way, not the SJW way, who is actually privileged, who actually occupies a position of social entitlement. And that's minorities and grievance seekers these days. That their feelings come first and our job is to feed them the kinds of feelings they want to have and to clap for them and say it's a very good thing that you feel that way. If you refuse to do this or if you put this person as a second order priority, you are evil and you will be destroyed, your relationships will be destroyed, and your reputation will be destroyed. We've internalized this. And I don't think it's any more, it's, it, it's not more evident anywhere than in the well-meaning people who are, and I'm going to be critical here, obviously. <laughs> I am Josh and this is my show. But I'm not, I'm not trying to call the people who are doing this bad people. I'm really, really not. I think most of them are good people, even people I've argued with over this. I think they're good people and I think they're well-meaning people, but I think they're badly mistaken and we need, and I'm going to say why. The well-meaning people who are trying to take a King Solomon approach to this suggestion, well, we'll just slice the baby in half. You'll get one half, I'll get the other half. They want to King Solomon the idea of respecting trans people. You can't do it. And this is hard for people because, and I'm talking about the kind of people who say, I happily use my friend's preferred pronouns out of respect for him or her. That, that sounds like an uncontroversial statement and maybe even a nice statement. I don't read it that way. When people do this, they're trying to reconcile a real conflict. And that conflict is between a friend who is telling you or signaling to you or a group of people saying, I need you and require you to do this for me if you care about me. Do you hear the manipulation under that? And the unpleasant truth, and they're trying to reconcile this with the unpleasant truth, that what these people are saying they need from you to demonstrate your friendship is that they need and require you to lie to them. Because that's what you're doing when you call your female friend who insists that she's a man and always has been but just transitioned. You're lying to her when you say you see her as a man. When you call her him. When you describe to other people that you're going to bring your guy friend Biff. You're just lying. I know, I know. 
Some of you are saying, this is an okay white lie. We're going to get there. But actually, don't argue that with me because I'm right. I'm not saying anything controversial. That is telling a lie. Look up the word lie in the dictionary if it hasn't been changed yet. You'll see. Pronouns are a lie. They're a lie that functions as a psychological prop. And I'm analogizing them to physical props in a theater set piece. A play about a conversation in a, in a corner pub is more believable if the stage is dressed in such a way that there's a bar and dim, maybe smoky lighting and a neon sign that advertising beer. Theater people use props in order to help the actors and the entire production help us, the audience, suspend our disbelief. That's why they use props. Pronouns are psychological props, just as surely as that can of beer on the stage is a prop. They help us, help us, suspend disbelief, or they warn us that we had better pretend that we have suspended our disbelief. This, it's hard to talk about this with well-meaning people without those well-meaning people feeling targeted. And sometimes I don't do that very well. Um, so I'm going to try to, to do it reasonably here because I've had some time to think about it and write the notes out. This is going to become an issue for me next month. And I, actually, this is, I want to promo this because I think you should come to this conference but there's also a purpose behind it. Next month on April 23rd in Fort Worth, the nonprofit organization Myth Informed is having a one-day conference called the Better Discourse Event. This is a place where controversial issues are talked about candidly and openly without fear of cancellation with people who disagree with each other but who know how to have civilized debate. I can't wait to go. And if you can, Please go because you're going to get you're going to get I mean, I'm not famous, but you're going to get famous people. You're going to get the actress Nikki Klein from Battlestar Galactica. You're going to get um, former academic and activist James Lindsay. You're going to get Carrie Smith, the podcaster. You're going to get Libby Emmons of the Post Millennial uh, commentator, Lauren Southern, Mike Harlow, lots of other people. And I'm going to be there on a panel with Blair White, who's a well-known transsexual, who has a YouTube channel, talks about these things constantly. Um, if you're interested in this, go to betterdiscourseevent.com. Th so I'm going to be on a panel with Blair White, and and the and I'm not sure who else. I'm sure it'll be more uh, people. But the topic will be, can someone be born in the wrong body? And here's my worry: that even even in an event like this, I predict that I'm going to feel pressure. It may be spoken, it may be looks on people's faces, it may be their body language, but I'm definitely going to feel pressure to use she and her pronouns for Blair White. Yes, I think I'm going to feel that pressure even from a group of people who put their hand up and say, I'm anti-woke. Because these things are hard for people, especially when it's personal, especially when somebody's right in front of you. And I'm conflicted. I'm very conflicted. I don't believe it or not. I mean, most of you, most of you will only ever encounter me, obviously, as a talking head on a show, and I'm I'm very candid on this show. But you don't know me in real life. I have friends and loved ones, just like everybody else. I too feel social pressure. I too worry about whether I'm saying or doing something that's going to make my friends' feelings hurt. I don't enjoy hurting people's feelings if it can be avoided. I'm not motivated to do that. So I, right now, as I look forward a month from now, I am feeling conflicted. I want to stay true to my principles, and I resent, highly resent, pressure wherever it comes from to tell a lie, a pronoun lie, in order that everybody in the room stay comfortable in that moment. I don't want to do that. On the other hand, what I don't want to do is give the appearance to either Blair or to other people there that I'm there to be a son of a bitch and that I came so that I could walk up to Blair and say, did you know you're a man, you're a he, he, he? Like, I wouldn't even act like that. And I don't actually want to insult. I don't know Blair. We've never, I, I can't wait to meet Blair. But I have no desire to insult somebody or make them feel uncomfortable, particularly in a public situation. So I do myself understand this tension between those two things. It's making me feel a little squirmy. 
honestly. Well, that's enough of that. Um, this has to do with what we call white lies. And I say that white lies are not white anymore. That is, they're not harmless. They're not only for the good. They're not untroubled. They're not restricted to the private sphere the way they used to be. They're not something that affects only the politics and feelings of friends around one single lunch table. They affect the entire public atmosphere, the staging and the props that we all live with. And I'm talking about the white lie, of course, of respecting my personal friend's pronouns because he, she, z, her is somebody that I personally like. Or the other one is, I will respect this person's pronouns because he or she does not demand that I see them as the opposite sex. Okay, th that's great that they don't, but I don't know why that is a motivator to lie and tell them you th think they're the opposite sex linguistically with the pronouns. This is not, not a, there's, <laughs> anyway, let me get out of the weeds here. Decades ago, when there was an actual gay community, we gay men often voluntarily called the very small group of transsexuals hyper-effeminate gay men who'd gone all the way with the surgery. We voluntarily called them she. It almost never left our subculture. It wasn't controversial. And it wasn't this fraught problem. Believe it or not, and if you are a young person who's gay, please listen to this. And try to believe me, because I'm telling you the truth. And if you talk to other people my age, they will tell you the same thing. Not one of these men, it would, nobody thought they were women. They didn't think they were women. They knew they weren't women. A lot of these guys were a lot of fun. Because they said, you know, they would joke around and say, I know I look like it, but I ain't got no pussy down here, honey. <laughs> right? Nobody was, I mean, they're pretending to a certain degree because they they've, they've They've got a mental problem that makes, in their mind, just too uncomfortable to be anything but um, a simulation of a woman. And I'm not saying that to be insulting, but they, they didn't actually try to command that people pretend that they were always women. This was voluntary. But things have changed. And when you tell a white lie today by respecting pronouns, especially when you talk about it in public and say, I respect these pronouns because I respect this person— You're not just saying what you're doing. You're actually making a judgment against people who won't go along with it, even if you don't mean to. And I know that a lot of people will, will get reactive against this because it happened this week on Twitter. They get very angry when I say this, and I don't mean it to make them angry, but it is true. So stop your bullshitting. When you say, I respect my friend's prone, I do it because I respect my friend, what you are saying is, I disrespect your friend. I don't respect trans people. I don't have the same feelings of common humanity with them that you do. No, I don't want to hear, no, I'm not. I don't want to hear it. I mean, you can say it as much as you want. You can leave comments if you want, but you're wrong. That is That implication is there. You cannot King Solomon this, and you can't have it both ways. Sorry to make it a little uncomfortable for you, but you're going to share my discomfort because you're in a pretty sweet spot right now. People like me are not. We, we people who won't lie and participate in this, we are already seen by the larger public as fair game for cancellation. We deserve punishment, economic ruin, and professional ignominy. We're already fair game. That's the goddamn truth. Your personal and private respect for your favorite person for whom you feel emotional aff affection isn't personal or private anymore, not in 2022. And I don't think that I'm mean or crazy or exaggerating to point this out. We seem to believe that affirming and respecting, that is playing along with someone's delusion, also is a psychologically positive thing for our friend. How do we know this? I'm not convinced that it is. I don't believe it. it, it it's helpful for your friend for you to lie and use the preferred pronouns any more than it would be for you to agree with your anorexic friend that she is in fact morbidly obese 
and she ought to go on a diet. Have you ever thought about that? Here's your opportunity. I'm going to leave you with two images. As an example of the extreme outcome, not every outcome is going to be this extreme, but these things are connected. This social atmosphere that we're participating in that maybe you are enforcing a little bit by publicly patting yourself on the back and telling people how you do it because you respect your friend, maybe you're participating in it a little bit too. This has all resulted in things like this. Take a look at your screen. This is a tweet from a woman named Stephanie Willard. And the picture, for those of you who can't see, it's a party for her child. There is a cake and two plates of cookies. The cookies are iced to look like breasts. So they've got tan icing around them and a little pink uh, dollop in the middle for the nipple. And I will point out that the ones on the right, the plate of cookies on the right, also has little pink icing around the rim. And you know what that's for? To indicate the scar of cutting the breasts off. And what's the legend written in icing on the cake? Yeet thine teats. This is mommy being Harry Potter cute, helping her, what she calls her son, yeet his teats. He, 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 he. And she says... We just celebrated my son's upcoming top surgery. That is her daughter who just had her tits cut off. And the hashtags are protect trans kids, trans rights, trans lives matter, trans rights are human rights, mama bear, mama bear. Yeah. You know what mama bear correlates with so often? I think you do and I don't have to say it. That's bad enough. This is bad enough but you're not prepared for what I'm gonna show you now. I'm gonna show you the same woman tweeting a year ago, one year before this top surgery party. This is what she said. My son, and I remind you, everybody, when she says her son, she's talking about a girl child. My son was nine when his stepdad, who was his rock, killed our four-year-old daughter and then himself. He, her, quote, son, is now 16, and I've noticed many things over the years where he is still nine, as in nine years old mentally. Plus, I've read that as kids hit brain growth, brain growth, they relive it all over again, which I definitely have seen. I've, I've got nothing. She deleted her account the other day. I wish I could erase my knowledge of what's happening to the children in this family. That's the show. Thank you for joining me. See you next week. For more conversation on the dark and disordered psychology that shapes today's cultural and political left, subscribe to our weekly audio podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and virtually anywhere else you get your podcasts. Let's learn to recognize these dynamics and call them what they are. Subscribe to Disaffected to learn how to break the spell. Do you like Disaffected? Do you like it enough to help pay for it? We'd love to have your support to grow and maintain this show. Donors get special access to our monthly Zoom hangouts. They're off-camera and unscripted. We talk about what you want to talk about. There are two ways to join. Patreon users can go to patreon.com slash disaffected or visit subscribestar.com slash disaffected.